and welcome to The Play Review with me, Douglas Schatz. And me, Jody Rylett. Hi, Jody. Hi, Douglas. How are you doing? Yes, good, thank you. Okay, I wonder if you'll be as good after we do this review. Anyway, the show that we are reviewing today is God of Carnage by Yasmina Reza, which is currently playing at the Lyric Theatre in Hammersmith in West London. The play, written in French and translated by Christopher Hampton, had its English language debut in the West End back in 2008. The play followed Reza's earlier play, Art, which was a worldwide hit in the 1990s, being translated into 30 languages and winning Olivier and Tony Awards. God of Carnage was similarly a popular and critical success, reprising the Olivier and Tony Awards, and in 2011, the play was also turned into a movie, Carnage, directed by Roman Polanski. So Reza and the play come to the lyric with a stellar CV. This revival is directed by the lyric's associate director, Nikolai Laberry, and the four-handed cast includes Freema Agumon, who is perhaps best known as Doctor Who's companion, Martha Jones. The action of the play all takes place on one afternoon in the elegant living room of a cultured middle-class couple, where they have invited another couple to come to discuss an incident that has occurred between their respective 11-year-old sons, one of whom has hit the other in the mouth with a stick, breaking two of his teeth. The parents of the victim want to understand what provoked the attack and to explore what action could be taken by way of resolution. So, Jody, did you know this play? And if so, or if not, what attracted you to go see it? So I knew of the play, but I didn't know it. I saw art with its original cast. God of Carnage is one of those ones that's frequently done in the amateur theatre circuit. So I was keen to see it. I liked the casting. I loved the lyrics. I was really excited to see this one. So that's what drew me to it. I actually did know the play. I can't be sure whether I saw the original production, which featured a great cast. I looked back up. Rafe Fiennes, Tamsin Grieg, Janet McTeer, and Ken Stott. Oh, wow. Yeah, which sounds great, doesn't it? So I might have seen it, but I'm afraid I don't remember much about it. However, I do know it quite well because we published it at Samuel French, so I've read it more than once. But I've always had a nagging question about Ray's plays, art and, and this one, as to whether I think they're anything other than slick and stylish entertainments in a very French style, if you know what I mean, Yeah. but ultimately somewhat superficial. So I was keen to revisit this play and, and look at it from that perspective. Yeah, it's quite ironic, really, when you consider that's pretty much the subject of art, right? Yes. Is, <laughs> is it art or is it not? Yes, yes, that's quite right. It's such a popular play and it, it ran for ages and it won multi-awards and I went to it with high expectations and I didn't yeah, I didn't get that much depth from it, really. So what about this one? Is there depth here? I didn't feel like there was particularly. I was a bit disappointed because I suppose I like this premise. Of the two couples, their children have had a violent altercation in the playground and they're meeting and being terribly civilised, almost competing for who can be the most civilised and adult in the way that they're dealing with this. And, and everybody's trying to be terribly decent about it. And I was waiting for this unravelling of the layers of politeness to start peel away as, as people's defences for their own children and their own competitive parenting styles started to come into play. And it didn't happen for me in the way that I hoped it would. I didn't feel like it really reached some savage conclusion. I was almost ready for it to finish. Come on, let's get to it. I can see where this is going rather than, oh, I can't believe what they're about to say next, which is what I hoped it would be. I think part of the problem for me was that they jumped into that far too fast. I think yeah. there wasn't any nuance to their disagreement and to the way these things unfolded. Of course, the theme of the play, I guess, is supposed to be that these layers of civilization, of social etiquette, are peeled away, as you say, are just a surface disguise for some more aggressive or animal instincts or savagery that uh, are deep inside us or not even that deep inside us. But it all seemed way too obvious to me. Yeah. Very predictable. And I guess because it starts off pretty high at note and kind of cartoonish in a sense, quite extreme, then there's nowhere to go, really. And as you say, so you, you know, you just want it to end. And in fact, I suppose it's one of the key questions about the play in a way 
that you have to overcome. My daughter said this to me after we came out was, why wouldn't they have just left? Yeah. The whole premise of the thing is if they have this falling out and it gets a little bit disagreeable early on, why wouldn't they have just up stakes and walked out? But of course, then the whole play is moot. Exactly. Yeah, she's quite right. I thought that myself. And I suppose the thing is, if you get too extreme too early, then that's even more of a question. They would have left. But if you play it so that they maintain the social niceties longer, then that may perpetuate the meeting. The other reason I thought that was kind of odd was that one of them actually is sick on stage. Yes. And yet stays. And yet stays. Exactly. I mean, there are two things. But one is she doesn't bother to get herself to the bathroom, which I don't mean to be too literal, but absolutely crazy. There is lots of warning. So there's no way she would have stayed and thrown up all over the elegant coffee table and art books. But anyway, that's one of the devices of the play. So I think we're not yet on board. I wanted to ask you first, we usually start with some easy things like the design and the set. What did you make of that? So it's a circular stage, a Petri dish, maybe, you know, as we're looking at the sort of bacteria of their hostility start to develop. I thought that was quite nice. It slowly rotates. I had a moment where I suddenly went, oh, what have they done with the sculpture? I didn't notice them take that off. And then I realised it was rotating. And I think the cleverness of a slow revolve in that would echo the ratcheting up of tension, as well as serving a practical purpose for a play that's set essentially in one space. It makes it more interesting, doesn't it? Because you get different angles, different perspectives and so on. So I did really like that. I liked the fact that this room very much was as if it had stepped out of the pages of a magazine or Pinterest. You couldn't imagine this to be the kind of a home that a 14-year-old boy would go running around in. (laughs) It was very stylized, showing the image that they want to project. So in that sense, very consistent with what the play was trying to do. Above the stage was a string of lights that slowly came down. I eventually started to notice that that was occurring I imagine that if you were in the stalls, this would have the impression of the tension crushing down on them. But from the circle where I was sitting, it didn't really have that effect. I didn't really notice those lights until late on. I didn't notice the revolve for a while, as you just said as well. And I don't think the lights thing, I I mean, I'm struggling in a way to understand what either of those devices add. I mean, yes, the revolve gave you different perspectives, and maybe it's to do with the changing allegiances between all these four as the arguments proceed, because, of course, what happens is at first they're aligned by a couple, naturally, who are unified in their stance on the incident. But it isn't long before we see the fault lines appearing in their views and in their relationships. And then as the arguments became increasingly bitter, then the men line up together or the women lined up together. Yeah. All of which sounds like rich material for drama, but actually... I also found that implausible most of the time, that they would change their stances so readily. Yes, again, it comes down to the nuances. The potential might have been there for this being a gradual exposure of the frailties and truths of these respective marriages, but it was out there so fast, and they're chopping and changing so fast. I thought that some of the characterizations as well were really inconsistent, particularly Alan, who's a lawyer, and very gruff and arrogant and chauvinistic and uninterested initially. I thought the inconsistency with that was that he ends up as a whimpering bull when his mobile phone is trashed by his wife. I just thought, where did that come from? It seemed completely silly. Yeah, I found the same. And I suppose the main thing was I was aware that these people were acting the whole time, which is a shame because they are all very good actors. So because of the style that it was, it it was slick, it was stylized, it was OTT. It's a deliberate choice from the director to do it that way. And they executed it very well. Freema Adjiman's very flamboyant with her arms, beating her chest and her arms were in the air all of the time. And you knew from the outset that she was a bit of a fake and a phony. She had this wonderful fixed frozen smile initially as she's mounting her attack as a pretense of civility, which was very impressive, but it was all at 10 decibels. 
exactly it was all loud you're right tender so that's a really good way of putting it. it was very obvious it was very flamboyant it was very out there it was sort of look how awful these people are and because it was so very much like that it got in the way of you being able to do that thing where you identify a little bit with it and go oh maybe I should look at my life a little bit which is really what what you would hope a play like this would cause you to examine but because they are so obviously awful it was much harder to identify That's a really important point. Actually, I read in the program note from Christopher Hampton, who did the translation, and again, I don't think any of this is his fault, that um, he was asked a question about it. Does this remain relevant, this play? And he essentially said these characters are recognizable to us. And uh, the point you have just made was they didn't really feel like that. All of them were exaggerated. So even though, as you say, these actors, I'm sure, are fine performers, But how they've been directed, perhaps, or how they've interpreted this production, I don't think they had the chance to give us any nuanced performance. It was all at really high pitch. Danita Goyle as Annette, she was possibly the most restrained, wasn't she? Yeah, which is in line with her character, wasn't it? That she was the more buttoned up. Initially, she had this admirable fraudeur for quite a while, quite calm by comparison to the others. And then I enjoyed her when she became a bit uninhibited as a drunk. I quite enjoyed her then as well. Martin Hudson, is it? He was He was Michael. I just found his excess really grating, both when he's being angry, but possibly more so when he was he had this sort of goofy, nerdy thing going on where he wasn't really even a proper adult. He was behaving like some child a lot of the time. I didn't really understand that. I just found it puerile and somewhat irritating. He was so out of touch. Oh, that's interesting. I sort of didn't mind that slightly nerdy man-child, bit of a useless bloke kind of way that he was playing it because I could sort of imagine that being a sort of surrendered personality that would live with somebody like Veronica so that that was kind of plausible and it made it all the more interesting what he did to that hamster because you wouldn't think him capable of such an act of heartless cruelty which again was like underneath his nerdiness and a good bloke fundamentally pretty harmless actually he's prepared to put his child's beloved pet out onto the street to fend for itself. So I didn't mind that. I didn't find it convincing when he's talking about being a Neanderthal. I thought, I don't think I could see him convince us that. You're right. He doesn't measure up to that. Actually, it's funny that Hamster, without giving away too many spoilers, but the fate of this pet Hamster becomes a focus of debate or serves as some sort of symbol in the unmasking of primal behaviors. But Again, I don't know, people found that funny and maybe it's telling, but I just found it somewhat trivial and not that funny, really, that whole device. One of the other things that, oh gosh, I sound like I'm just listing things that irritated me, but Alan, the lawyer, he keeps getting these phone calls on his mobile phone because he's acting for a pharmaceutical company or about to launch a new pain relieving drug, but there have been incidents reported of severe side effects and Alan is receiving a series of calls about this where he's counseling the company to deny all responsibility and cover up these reports, et cetera, et cetera, demonstrating, of course, a distinct lack of moral integrity, mm-hmm. which is pretty obvious. But the thing that was extraordinary about those scenes is that the whole play stops while he has this conversation with someone unseen on the other end of a mobile phone, and the other three just stand there and have to wait as we have to wait. And frankly, it's just boring. It was dull because it was done repeatedly. And really what would happen is you'd take the call, which would be considered rude anyway, because you're trying to talk about something that's quite important, your family. And clearly you're saying, I'm a terribly important person. I must take this call. So that's rude enough in the constraints of the sort of civilised society that they're talking about. But he would have stepped out and they could have done that quite easily with that circular set. So you're absolutely right. And they could have done that once, but they did it five times and it just became tedious. You talked about some people found the hamster bit funny. Do you think it's a comedy? Yeah, I suppose in a lot of ways I do. The theme that she's trying to reach for would possibly be more impactful if you do play it as comedy, but not in the full on farce that they basically became. I don't think it's that. Mm. It's hard to say because I also felt, what do you feel about what the play is about? To me, some of the themes are interesting, but the way that it's written felt a bit dated now. Yeah, it felt dated. Why did you feel that? 
the main thing I think that made it feel dated to me was the, the premise in a way because I know you think how awful people can be to one another on social media etc so that it's a different sort of society for a start also this kind of thing have you ever been part of a whatsapp group in a primary school possibly not but go on well, you very quickly put that chat on mute, my friend, I tell you, because it, behaviours are very peculiar and people are very defensive around their children and, and so on. And people have, can be very passive aggressive around that space. So it just suddenly felt very dated to me, all of that in a way that they're meeting in a room to talk about this. Wouldn't this have all have been had out in a different way? There could have been a much more modern way of going about it. I thought the gender roles or gender politics, even that are expressed at various moments, seem pretty out of touch now, pretty crude, the alignment of the men together at times. And Alan in particular, who has lines like, men don't like women who are basically committed to solving problems in the world or doing anything serious. He says, that's not what we like about women. What we like about women is sensuality, wildness, hormones. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. See, I've just deleted that from my memory. <laughs> I did not like that. He's got another one when uh, his wife is crying, I think. Stop sniveling. When a woman cries, a man is immediately provoked to the worst excesses. I mean, these sort of generalizations just seem crude to me now. And Michael has this rant about marriage and children, where he literally is pushed to the point where he says marriage is the most terrible ordeal God can inflict on you. Marriage and and children are as well. I mean, that line, to be fair, did get one of the biggest laughs of the night. <laughs> <laughs> so that it obviously resonates still, you know. Uh, but it, it's not that far short of a mother-in-law joke, is it? You know. Well, there you go. Maybe these truths still do apply, although I don't know. It felt a bit crude to me. You know, the theme again, going back to the theme about this is a play that's supposed to expose these baser instincts, and that you know all the social propriety is covering these things up, and it doesn't take much poking for them to burst forth. All of that's fine, but again, seemed very obvious to me. In fact, made even more obvious. Did you notice the music? Is there sort of strings? Was there a violin, cello? Yeah, a cello. So they literally, when Alan, I think it is, who makes this portentous speech where he says that he believes in the god of carnage, by which I assume he means our potential for self-serving anarchy or something along those lines. And if to signpost the point... <laughs> Even more obviously, the cello starts to play under his speech at that point. And that happened a couple of times. And I sort of thought, really? Yeah, that was quite heavy handed, wasn't it? So I think we're concluding not our favorite. We are. And in fact, I come back to where I started. I apologize for being so contrary. I was just not won over by this production, which I'm sad to say has also not advanced the reputation of this play or Yasmina Reza in my eyes. Perhaps a more nuanced production where we do see these fault lines of the respective marriages exposed more slowly. I don't know. I may be wrong about the merits of the play. I might have to go and read it again to see if it would work in someone else's hands. But I don't think it works in this case. It would need more updating. And it could have been quite fun to have set it in Islington, sort of liberal, elite. It just felt like it needed a, a different sort of reboot than the one that it has had. Anyway, that's enough negativity for today. <laughs> Thank you, Jody. This is not like us. It is not. I have to say to listeners, this is not our usual. Usually we're quite good about choosing things for a start. And we were interested in this play, but it didn't tick our boxes. Thanks for listening, everyone, to another play review. See you again soon, Jody. See you soon. Bye-bye. We'd love to hear what you think. So please visit theplaypodcast.com to share your comments or email us at plays at theplaypodcast.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.